Our next speaker is a great honor that he is joining us in this symposium, Mario Molina. He is a co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, 1995, together with Paul and Sherry Rowland. He uh, also recently received the Medal of Freedom, which is really a rare, rare uh, honor for a scientist. Uh, but, uh, he, was, um, he was actually also at some point in his career at UC Irvine, and then he worked in the, as a postdoc in the lab of, uh, of Sherwood Rowland, where they actually discovered the role of uh, CFCs in ozone destruction. Uh, currently, he's at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at uh, UC San Diego. And uh, he's also, I would like to mention, he's a member of President Obama's team on environmental issues. And finally, I would also like to mention that he has been a long-term member of the advisory board of our, of our institute. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here and uh, have the opportunity to uh, congratulate Paul, my good old friend, for many years for his 80th birthday. So what I'm going to do in these few minutes is um, I'm going to talk a bit about climate change in a way that is quite complementary to what uh, we just heard from Ralph Cicerone. But let me start a little bit with a historical perspective. So I'm first going to show you how I met Paul. Let me see. It's supposed to be the green. There we go. I'm supposed to press the green spot, but there are three green spots. Let me see. There we go. <laughs> now, now I got it. This is how I met Paul. Namely, I was a student uh, dealing with very fundamental chemistry. And when I first had to learn about the stratosphere, I did whatever was logical to do. But it was when I came across Paul's uh, findings that the things be began to be very clear to me. And in fact, as you know, this, uh, this uh, uh, famous equations uh, which Paul discovered uh, turned out to be extremely important. But when I uh, started to deal with, with uh, the issue of the CFCs, it was not difficult, of course, just to translate that to chlorine, just replacing NO by Cl, uh, knowing, of course, that the CFCs would be a source of chlorine. Uh, it was a Subsequently, we realized that uh, Raf Cicerone and Rich Tolarski had already sort of worried about chlorine in the stratosphere. But the additional issue here that is not uh, spelled out is that it's not only the chemistry, but Paul had also addressed the issue, where do these nitrogen oxides come from? Nitrous oxide and so on. So that allowed me, I remember very well doing calculations, to see, well, what is the amount? What's the source strength? for these compounds. And it's one, when I made the comparison of this source strength with the industrial production of CFCs, that's when I realized that the issue was indeed uh, something to worry about, because it could have been that the amount of chlorine sent by CFCs would have been trivial. But the fact that the numbers uh, were comparable is what made the issue really uh, potentially a very serious one. And, but there's one more sort of historical note I want to point out. I was, of course, working with Sherry Rowland at that time. We were both coming from the fundamental sciences, learning about the atmosphere. And uh, we developed this, this so-called CFC ozone depletion theory, as I just said, very much based on, on Paul's uh, initial uh, insights. Uh, furthermore, I, sh I should note that to me what was striking is uh, Paul actually studied engineering, but he was a very good chemist. I remember borrowing from him a, a couple of sheets of tables with, with uh, bond strengths. And from those, he understood very well to be able to select which reactions matter and which don't, namely those that are slightly exothermic in the atmosphere. So it was a very good guideline as to what works in the stratosphere. Anyhow, we sort of <coughs> set up this theory 
And of course, Sherry and I checked it with Paul. We wanted to see whether it makes sense or, or whether it, it all sounded crazy. And we were very pleased to find out that Paul thought, hmm, yeah, this is something interesting. It's, uh, it needs to be pursued. And because of that, Sherry and I decided to send the paper to Nature. Uh, because the, we thought, well, the finding might be important, so let's send it to a prestigious journal. For me, of course, it was the first paper that, uh, uh, to publish in a prestigious journal. But I also learned that it's very important to publish in nature or science, as you know, you cannot make a press release. You have to hide your results. You have only to talk about it with your friends, because if it appears in the newspapers, they don't publish it anymore. They won't have the right to be the first ones. And so little we know that Paul in Sweden talked about this in some sort of scientific, scientific meeting, but there was a reporter from the Svenska Tagesblatt, I believe, in, in Sweden, and it appeared in the newspaper. Well, Sherry and I thought, Nature is going to reject the paper. Fortunately, they did not how to read Swedish, or they, and so the paper actually did get published, with, as you see, with some mistakes. But uh, anyhow, we were lucky. What happens, we got worried because it took many months to get published. Later, we found it was not because of the leak in, in the newspapers, but because they couldn't find reviewers. It was sort of a strange topic at, the, at that time. Anyhow, fortunately, we were lucky, everything worked, it was published, but again, from the very beginning, we were very much in touch with, uh, with Paul. Let me switch now to uh, climate change, but again, the perspective here, complementary, as I just said, to, to what Raph, uh, Raph Cicero just explained this, uh, <clears throat> Why is it so much more difficult with climate change uh, for society uh, to do something about it? Many things are happening already. Uh, states like California and the United States are taking measures. Many countries in Mexico, we even have a climate change law and so on. But there's no international agreement, as you all know, such as the Montreal Protocol. And because of that, emissions are still uh, going up. They are not going down as they... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, as I should. Well, uh, <coughs> uh, Raph explained many of the reasons, but one very important one is that this, this issue has become politicized. Of course, energy is used uh, uh, for so many different activities in our economies, for the growth of the economy, but the, the, it, perhaps the, the clearest example is U.S. Congress, the Republicans, which is half the Congress, took as a, as a mantra sort of to negate the science of climate change, to, to cl claim that's really a hoax, okay? That's the Green Party claiming that it's just a means of some groups and some scientists that uh, somehow or other got involved with them to have the government impose on us the sort of things that we need to do. And so the science is just not credible according to this extreme view. Well, because of that, one of the activities I've been involved with is how can we communicate this to the public and perhaps to scientists? It's beginning to happen, but in very simple terms. And that's why I put together these biographs. This is the sort of science we should be able to explain in high school and certainly first year college or so, <clears throat> namely that there's a natural greenhouse effect which is responsible for our climate, that, and where does this come from? Well, that the, you know, the atmosphere is transparent to visible radiation, but it's not transparent to infrared radiation, and there's just a very small portion of the atmosphere <coughs> that is uh, responsible for this absorption of infrared radiation, and the net effect is for, for the, our planet that has a very thin atmosphere, like the skin of an apple, is, is to have something equivalent to a blanket. But I thought I, this is something I show sometimes even when I talk to people that are not scientists, just for historical reasons. 
Nothing else than Max Planck, of course. I mean, to revolutionize physics at the beginning of the previous century. So this is very basic, very important science. It's a shame that much of this science is, is considered to be a hoax. Okay. Where would quantum mechanics be? Okay. Even Einstein's Nobel Prize is because of his photoelectric effect. So not only energy comes in packets, but radiation as well, of course, quanta and so on. But with these equations, one can calculate that the average surface temperature of the planet should be uh, minus 18 degrees Celsius. Instead, it is plus 15. And we know very well why, and that's because it's, it's the atmosphere transparent to the, the energy that comes in from the sun is not transparent to infrared radiation. But what is interesting also, and again, I'm summarizing here in just a few seconds, sort of things we need to be able to communicate to the public, I repeat. This is all based on observations. These are experiments. These are not just wild theories. And so one can measure these properties of the atmosphere, and one can measure also with physical, laws of physical chemistry and so on, that water vapor is very important because it absorbs about three-fourths of this infrared radiation responsible for this enormous change in temperature in the climate. But here is perhaps where we begin to differ sometimes from well-known scientists that are not physical chemists. I have some examples of some atmospheric dynamics to sort of even miss this point, namely that water is a feedback. It's not the dominant <coughs> uh, substance that controls the climate. It's carbon dioxide and the non-condensable gases because it's very clear that by absorbing that remaining one-fourth of the infrared radiation, if you were to remove carbon dioxide and the other gases, methane that you know and so on, but mostly carbon dioxide, the atmosphere would begin to cool somewhat. Water would condense. So water, because it's so short-lived, responds to the main gases and the planet would freeze. And so without carbon dioxide, water could not, certainly could not hold the climate as we know it and the average temperature would drop below the minus 18 degrees that we know. So this is all what we call the natural way the climate works, the natural greenhouse effect. And because of this, <coughs> it's quite clear that carbon dioxide and the non-condensable gases are the thermostat of the planet. Those are the, 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 that small amount, less than one fourth of one percent of the uh, composition of the atmosphere is what controls the climate. And you can go back millions of years and see that that still holds in, in, with paleoclimate studies and so on. So if you now couple uh, to, to this information, what's happening to the composition of the atmosphere? And on these uh, scales of 10,000 years, you see how, how it's suddenly changing. Of course, that's the Industrial Revolution, but mostly burning fossil fuels. Methane, of course, comes from cattle, rice paddies. But it's a sudden change, and that's certainly Anthropocene. Okay, That's caused by human activities. These are measurements. And these are measurements as well. You show that temperature also suddenly changes. So the obvious question is, if carbon dioxide is the thermostat of the planet, it's suddenly changing, and the temperature suddenly changes, shouldn't we be suspicious that there's a connection between the two? And of course, as we all know, that groups like the IPCC <clears throat> In the 2007 report, which Susan Solomon had so much to do with, they concluded that there, of course, the temperature change <coughs> and the composition change are connected. <coughs> but climate is a complex issue, so we're not really sure. There's only a 90% probability that that's the case. And with a new the IPCC report that just came out, that 90% increased to 95%. So I could go uh, on and on, but I want to spend the last few minutes. How many minutes? Do I? Oh, I think I have the clock here, yes. Uh, just uh, dwelling, giving you a few examples of <clears throat> where these questions come from, because it's not just 
from Republicans in Congress in the United States. There are people doubt about that here, even here in Europe, but some scientists as well. But they, they turn out to be mostly non-experts, okay? So most of you might have seen these sort of ads. There are about 16 scientists that got together in 2012, and they made this statement that it is the sort of things we're talking about are probably very exaggerated. And I'm citing here Ivan Gieber just because some of us have met him in Lindau. Paul Krutzen as well, he's a Nobel Prize winner, but sort of not a very uh, common Nobel Prize winner because he gets his scientific information not from the scientific literature, but from the web. Okay, and so he concluded that uh, he, climate change is not something he was very much convinced of. And since he resigned from the American Physical Society because he didn't like the language he used. Fortunately, in the Wall Street Journal, which is a very conservative journal, as, as you know, the American Physical Society responded that he misinterpreted their their statement, of course, they very much agree, like the, the most uh, scientific organizations, that climate change is indeed a very serious issue, that there are, of course, uncertainties. <coughs> but, uh, of course, the response from the scientific community is that it, uh, uh, they did respond in the Wall Street Journal. If you, let me just read it, if you want. Uh, do you consult your dentist about your heart condition? If you need surgery, you want a highly experienced expert in the field, a cardiologist who has done a large number of, uh, of uh, operations in, in that field. So the claim here, of course, is that uh, <clears throat> dentists are not always very good at cardiology, what I should add is my own dentist, if I should consult him about my heart condition, he would tell me, you're crazy, why don't you go and see your cardiologist? But obviously there are some dentists like these ones who believe they know just about everything. Anyhow, just to add a little bit more to Yever's uh, uh, opinion, as we learned it in, in Linda, why does he doubt what we're talking about? And then I, I learned it firsthand. Unfortunately, I did not have a chance to talk to him at, at any length because we did not have a chance to, a, a chance to debate. But like a, an experimentalist, we know we can measure temperature at home in the laboratory. So indeed, if you claim that temperature over a few years has gone up half a degree, uh, it, it's not quite clear how a normal thermometer can do it and so on. So that's why he thought this whole thing must be crazy. And consequently, is climate change pseudoscience? Absolutely. So most of you guys here are pseudoscientists, according to this statement. Of course, he didn't read the literature because the web is not always that accessible. And of course, there are many questions. How do you measure temperature so accurately? But the statistics is overwhelming. There have now been books, many papers. If there are thousands and thousands of measurements, you can indeed measure half a degree, 0.8 degrees uh, quite accurately. But anyhow, here is what, if I put all this in a nutshell, there has been a very well concerted campaign, particularly in the United States, but that has had an influence uh, all over the planet, uh, which has to do with uh, an organized public relations campaign to discredit climate change. But we start with some statistics. These are now well known. Uh, there are several papers that sort of uh, uh, scan the scientific literature and also make surveys. Uh, surveys and the findings are at about 97% of the experts all agree that climate change is happening. It's a consequence <coughs> of human activities. But the media doesn't agree with this 97%, and that's because this campaign, it's relatively easy to convince the media that there are always two sides. 
one side thinks yes, but the other side think, other side thinks no. That <clears throat> makes things more interesting. But that's uh, sort of widely wrong. It does not represent uh, what the findings of the experts are. And because of that, public perception is very badly skewed. And that's why politically it's something that can still happen in, in the United States. But my hope is that we will move away from this age of astrology and that it will take only a few years perhaps to go back to rationality. And I will, let me just end, I have just less than a minute, but I'll end up with this <clears throat> view with my colleagues of MIT where I spent many years. One way to explain climate change to the public is it's like playing a game of roulette and we are playing with the roulette uh, <clears throat> to the left. Uh, because science is uncertain, we can't tell for sure how much will temperature change in a few decades or by the end of the century, but we could change roulette. And what is remarkable is that the change costs only one or two percent of global GDP. It's very cheap. How much does it cost not to change? Clearly a lot more. But the bottom line is that there is some probability, a significant one, 10, 20, 30 percent, that we will have real catastrophes. And from an economic perspective, that's uh, something society should completely rule out. That's such a huge probability in terms of uh, <clears throat> disasters that it should be out of the question, but society hasn't quite yet come to, uh, <clears throat> to believe that. And of course, perhaps the main issue to do that is an ethical one. We should leave to future generations a planet where they can have uh, the same standard of living that we have, and we should certainly follow the example of the Montreal Protocol. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.